everything here is printed in FDM, on my stock standard hobbyist level printer. An Alagu Neptune 3 Pro, with its standard 0.4mm nozzle. As mini painters, we are used to expecting the highest possible quality from our minis. From incredibly detailed plastic kits to the ever increasing resolution of resin printers. But what if we just want to play some D&D? We just want to put some models on the table. What if we don't want to worry about the fumes or the mess of a resin printer or the hefty price tag of something like a plastic model? FDM has always gotten somewhat of a bad rap when it comes to the tabletop hobby. Most frequently it is praised for printing large scale terrain, but that's about it. After moving into my smaller apartment and having to part ways with resin printing, I had to ask myself, are we sure that FDM can't do the same job? Now, FDM is never going to match the quality of a resin or plastic model, but that isn't really the point. The point is seeing if I can get something off of this printer that I'm keen to paint, and that I'm happy to put on the table come game night. Something to print the goblins and the kobolds, or those one-off monster encounters. And there are some blemishes. There's some subtle layer lines, and the print time was longer than resin, but these will absolutely do the job. But if you don't believe me now, just wait until they're painted. There's a few tricks that I use along the way that really make FDM minis shine. Both of these awesome kobold sculpts are by Artisan's Guild. For the kobold sorcerer here, I beefed up his spell effects and blender to make them thicker and more likely to survive printing. And as for the shield kobold, I customized his pose by bending his arm and making his spear one-handed. When it comes to FDM printing minis, it is great to have some knowledge of tools like Blender to do small tweaks like this. When it comes to actually painting my FDM minis, I tend to prefer using a more satin primer, something like a Rust-Oleum Black spray can. I find that spray primers do a really nice job of filling in some of those last few layer lines. But for these models, I wanted to try and see if it would be any different if I primed with just Army Painter's brush-on primer. When base coating, I find it's best to work from the deepest layer outwards. For these kobolds, that means skin tones first. For their skin, I will be using Basilisk Red from the Army Painter Fanatic Mega Set, which I will say now are awesome paints. I've always used Army Painter War paints, but when I got my hands on the Fanatic range, it was like a light bulb had turned on. I had a real, this is what painting should feel like kind of moment. I finally felt in control of the paint, and frankly, until this point, I hadn't really enjoyed the painting part of the hobby. I'm not going to go in depth on the Fanatic paints, because there are plenty of other videos out there on that, but I just wanted to throw in my two cents. I'm painting these as I would any other model, thinning my paints slightly, though maybe not quite as much as I would for a plastic mini. I want this base coat to become a nice, smooth canvas to work on later, and for that it needs to have a slight thickness to it. This will simply help to remove any of those micro layer lines that might still be present across the model. By using a slightly thicker than usual paint and hitting those layer lines now, I avoid having them be picked out and emphasized by any washes or glazes later in the painting process. This is where my usual satin spray primer would really shine. It would have given this process a head start, and made it really easy to remove the last few imperfections with the base coat. Whereas here, I am now relying entirely on that first layer of paint to do the job. Moving on to the browns, for which I'll be using oak brown, I am being conscious to limit my base colors. The more colors I need on my base layer, the more time and care I have to spend here, when all I really want to do is get a layer of paint down. Things like the horns and the claws that will ultimately be an off-white bone can be base coated in my red. They're small enough that I can pick them out when I'm already working on highlights and small details. Of course, if I had larger parts of the model that were also bone, I would base coat all of these together. But on this model, the bone areas are so small, I won't bother. Likewise, any areas like the skull or the potions on the belt can just be base coated with the brown. That way I can pick out those details later and have a nice clean divide between the colors. With those done, it just leaves some greens for some of the details, and some grey for the nice rocky bases. I'll be using green for the sorcerer's spell effect, his snake friend, and the back of his cloak. And for the shield bearer, he gets green on his undershirt and his poisonous spear. With the sorcerer's cloak, I keep the inside brown, giving the cloak a look as if it was lined. Sure, most kobolds would use something like a creature's hide as their clothing, but not this guy. He managed to steal a wealthy nobleman's cloak and just tore up the bottom to make sure it looked cool. Any way you can add story to your minis, absolutely do it. Especially for D&D. With these kobolds, I'm going to use them as part of a specific encounter. So, when the players inevitably loot the bodies, they can find that fancy cloak that's been deliberately weathered by its new owner. 
And if your players are curious enough to look, maybe there's a name tag on the inside of a wealthy nobleman who would be incredibly happy to get his cloak back. Who's gonna say no to an easy side quest? With a base coat of colour, despite feeling a little flat, these models are well on their way to being perfectly fit for a D&D session. Now, highlights and detailing are an obvious and essential next step for mini painting, but I would argue this is even more true for FDM minis. By creating points of interest in the forms of highlights and saturated areas, we can easily draw the eye away from any really obvious blemishes that are still noticeable on the model. For the skin tones, I'm going to be going straight up to my brightest red. Rather than layering on two or three different reds, I'm going to jump up to pure red, and just thin it enough that I don't get full saturation in one pass. Then, when I want to pick out some areas of focus later, I can select some parts of the model to push a bit further. And just because our green base coats are all the same green, doesn't mean that our highlights have to be. For the back of the cloak I'm going to be using army green, a more desaturated colour better fitting of a cloak, whereas the spell effect will get a layer of green skin followed by rainforest, and finally dotting it with some ancient stone to really sell that sickly poison feeling. And if I feel it's too bright or losing contrast, I can bring some of that initial green back in with a glaze. And I just followed the same stages for the shield bearer's undershirt and poison to match as well. The sorcerer's snake friend will also get a lick of green skin, but is instead followed up by a muted ochre colour. This will help make it feel different to both the cloak and the poison. The more neutral palette will also help it disappear into the background, allowing the focus to fall on the face and the poison string. The browns will get a basic highlighting of onyx skin and in some places a few weathering scratches of that same ancient stone we used before. Because I want the focus here to be on the face and the poison, I don't want these browns to stand out too much. Even though there are multiple textures of brown across the model, the cloaks and leathers and the wood, I'm going to be highlighting them all with the same colours. This again helps to reinforce those focal points on the model by not drawing any attention away from them with these browns. These are starting to look really good. And I'm always blown away around this stage, because it's around now that painting an FDM Mini stops feeling like painting an FDM Mini, and starts just feeling like painting any other model. And once that happens, you can stop looking at these models for what they aren't, and start looking at them for what they are. And that's all the more satisfying. The Shield Wielding Cobalt has a few metallic areas, which I'll pick out next. I often like to mix in a warm or a cool paint to the Army Painter Plate Mail Metal, depending on the colours around it. Because this cobalt is primarily warm tones, I'll mix in a tiny amount of muted blue, just to help the metals pop. Once the metals are coated, a quick wash of dark tone goes over them. I do come back and pick most of this wash back up with a dry brush. I just want that dark tone to tint the metal a little bit and sit in the very deepest areas. With the metals done, I will shift my focus to the horns and the bones. I will do a quick base coat of onyx skin over whatever colour is underneath, and I'm just making sure that I get like 80% of the area at this point. Then I'll highlight them up using that same ancient stone we've been using. While I still have the ancient stone on my brush, I'll go ahead and dot in the whites of the eyes. I never like using a pure white for this, as it stands out too much and causes the face to feel a little cartoony, so this ancient stone's a great substitute. And with a final line of black in the eyes, these models are almost done. After a quick dry brush of some ash grey over the rock on the bases, I thin down some of the leftover browns and greens on my palette, and just use them like a wash or a glaze to add a little bit of colour and interest to the rocky bases. The final touch for these models will be a couple of mountainous looking grass tufts, something that looks like it could have sprung out from the cracks in the rocks. Finally, a stroke of matte black around the base rooms, and these little guys are done. So yeah, these FDM minis are not perfect, but they are perfectly fine. So much so that I'll be using them in my next D&D campaign. While not as easy as plastic or as detailed as resin, these FDM prints look fantastic once they're painted up, and I'm sure they'll look even better from a foot away at the table getting absolutely slaughtered by the characters in my next campaign. So while FDM minis might take a bit of trial and error before you're confident, an FDM printer is definitely a viable option for someone who just wants models to put on the table. 
So what do you reckon? Would you be happy with this quality of minis to put on your table? Or would the time and the quality steer you away? Either way, for someone like me who doesn't have access to resin printing right now and doesn't have every mini available to them in plastic, FDM minis will continue to be a big part of my hobby. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please be sure to let YouTube know by hitting all the buttons below, and be sure to subscribe to see some more cool D&D related miniature painting and 3D printing in the future. If anyone is interested in seeing how I got these minis ready for painting, from model checks and modification to slicer and support settings, all the way to clean up and priming, let me know down below. If there's enough people keen, maybe it's something we can look at on the channel in the future. Anyway, thanks all. Have a good one.